Hello and welcome. Before we properly start this event, I have a few housekeeping points to share. Uh, due to the number of participants, we have muted you, but there will be time for a Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. So please feel free to submit any questions you have in the chat to Anna Monson. Also, we're recording the event and we will send you the link as soon as it's been tidied up a little bit by the SSE team, which might take a couple of days. So welcome to this panel discussion on the future of travel and of urban mobility, which has been organized by the SSE together with the UK Alumni Hub, the UK Friends of SSE, which I am part of. There are more than 100 alumni and corporate partners here today, and we're pleased to have participants from almost every European country, as well as from the US, Latin America, Africa, Asia. And I think this in itself is a clear reflection of the SSE's global reach. We're also happy to have a number of current SSE students with us. And to you, I would like to extend a special welcome into the alumni network, which I hope will allow you to keep in touch with SEC long after you have left Sphere of 65. SEC is continuously developing in response to and in anticipation of changes in the world around us. A few examples of this are the House of Innovation, the Bachelor Program in Retail Management, which builds on the global success of the Swedish retail industry, Sweden through the crisis and other research projects related to the COVID crisis and free the educational mission which has been developed, among other things, to develop and emphasize the human skills that enable us to succeed in an increasingly digital world. But still, there are also many things that remain the same at our old school. The focus on academic excellence, the strong sense of community, and the aim to educate professionals who can hit the ground running and make a difference in their chosen field. As alumni, we play an important part in all of this. We continue to benefit from what SSE has to offer, if we choose to, and we contribute. Our input helps the SSE to stay relevant. We act as ambassadors, whether we're aware of it or not, in the effort to recruit the brightest students. And remembering that only 17% of SSE's budget is funded by state grants, many also choose to contribute financially. In short, as an alum, you are important to the SSC, and I hope that you will enjoy this event as well as many to come. Being a small international business school based in Stockholm, the SSE continues to punch well above its weight. This is reflected in international ranking tables and maybe most importantly, through the many successful SSE educated professionals all over the world. Today's panelists are of course, great examples of this. And I'm pleased to present to you, Henrik Schellberg, Friedrich Jelm, and Andreas Schörling. Henrik Schellberg is CEO of Aways, which is Europe's leading staycation group with more than 100,000 accommodations in 36 countries with 8 million guests and 4,800 employees. Henrik was one of Expedia's first employees in London, where he spent 12 years and eventually became president of their affiliate network. He's also a non-executive director of Finnair. Joining Henrik on the panel is Friedrich Jelm, who founded Voy in 2018 and has already scaled it to 40 cities in 11 countries, raising $355 million while doing this. Prior to Voy, Henrik founded Guestit and worked for Avito, a Russian blocket like platform which was founded by Swedes based in Russia. And moderating the discussion is Andreas Schörling, who is Managing Director of Flixbus's UK operations. Flixbus is a platform for long distance travel, land travel, mostly by bus, 
that in 2019 had 64 million passengers across more than 30 countries. Andrea started his career at Rocket Internet, establishing and growing new ventures around the world. Since then, he has focused on the mobility space with experiences both from ride hailing at GET and micromobility at Lime. And last but not least, Andreas is also a trustee of the UK Friends of SSE. And with that, let's start a fun. Over to you, Andreas. Thanks, Annette. And once again, a warm welcome to Henrik and Fredrik. Big thank you for joining us here tonight. We think it's a great opportunity to showcase success stories within the alumni community and for all of us to really be proud of being part of, of this community. I'm really excited about the conversation we will have uh, during this event. The structure will be a 40 minute discussion together with Friedrich and Henrik, followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. So please, if you have any questions, write them in the chat uh, to Anna Monson, who will then help us in uh, forwarding those questions to Henrik and Friedrich. The themes during our discussion will be three. It's uh, the, the vision of uh, uh, a ways and boy, the strategy that they uh, deploy in order to succeed and um, the, the near term plans that they have. And to get everything started, we wanna start with a poll and, and ask uh, uh, who of you have been using the, um, uh, the services that Friedrich and, and Henrik uh, represents and, and their respective product categories. Uh, so Elsa will help us put the question on the screen and then we will get back to that after we discuss the, the respective visions. Uh, so let's start with the vision. Uh, obviously, the, we cannot pretend that COVID is, is not happening at the moment, but we were hoping not to focus on, on the kind of detailed operational impact that COVID is having on everyone, but rather look at what are the structural changes that are happening to the respective markets due to the uh, pandemic. So we'd really be interested in, in hearing your post-pandemic vision for, for your industries. And Henrik, if you would be kind enough to start, uh, it, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts because even before the pandemic, there were debates and discussions regarding the sustainability of uh, tourism. There were terms such as flu, scam were, were invented. And um, uh, during the pandemic, we've seen an increase in staycation. So if you could tell us a bit, what is your vision for travel? Uh, I'm disappointed, Andreas, because I, I thought people wanted to hear about the operational impact of uh, Angela Merkel's announcement today of further restrictions in Germany and how we will deal with the terms and conditions and refunds, um, uh, which has been the story for the last uh, year. No, uh, I mean, travel is um, no disrespect to Frederick, but um, travel is the best industry in the world. Um, I think the first tour operating product was sold by Thomas Cook, I think in 1847, where they took a train up to the northeast of, of, of England to go on a, the first package tour ever sold. And, and the interesting thing with travel is it, it pretty much moves to GDP. So GDP goes up, travel goes up. And, and the reason for that is as you grow a middle class, in any country you are, uh, people want to travel. People want to discover the world, whether it's the world near to them or the world far away. And, and what we have seen for anybody reading any newspapers uh, in the world, um, you know, the restriction on travel that COVID has imposed has, has highlighted, and you can see it in the newspaper, just how much people are longing to go back to be able to explore either the world near them or the world far away. So I feel extremely, um, I mean, it's sort of like many things in life. I happen to land in this industry by serendipity, uh, but I'm a very proud travel agent. And, um, and now I'm very proud to work in a segment of the market that focuses on staycation. So, we, we see the future as very bright, uh, and we know that the minute restrictions are lifted, uh, we are able to provide a um, you know, very safe, uh, fantastic holiday, but also one that is environmentally friendly. Thank you. And similarly then, Frig, 
I think there's a challenge there from Hendrik's side with which industry that's that's the best. But it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts because pre-COVID, I think a lot of cities were struggling with congestions. And I think everyone realized that by just adding roads and cars doesn't solve the, the issue, quite on the contrary. And due to the pandemic, there's a lot of changes happening to city centers. So what, what's your view on, on how the cities will look like in the future and, and how will we move in them? Thank you, Andreas. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and um, um, also thanks to, yeah, to the rest of the, of the SSE crowd for, for organizing this. And I guess, uh, Andreas, you and me being in the transportation industry then would argue that without transportation, there would be no travel. Uh, so I guess we are the kind of capillary system that uh, makes uh, Hendrik's business model possible, uh, we would argue. I think what we are seeing happening overall is, uh, yeah, in transportation is a few things. And I would only touch upon yeah, those that I think are relevant uh, for kind of urban transportation and cities back to your question. I think, first of all, what we're seeing is the unbundling of the car. Um, cars have been the, you know, the central, uh, yeah, privately owned cars have been the central part in transportation for, for a long time now. Uh, that is starting to change um, as, um, you know, technology uh, makes it possible for, for mobility solutions to be, um, yeah, connected uh, to be you know with uh, yeah electric and uh, uh, run on uh, more sustainable renewable um, energy sources um, autonomous um, as well uh, of course and also shared so i think what what we're seeing now is that a variety of mobility solutions micro mobility shared micro mobility um, like we are offering is one of them uh, what you are offering at Flixbus uh, is another. All I think aimed at, uh, at the same thing, attacking the huge, 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 huge market that has been uh, privately owned cars. Um, and uh, we are moving fast um, on that. And I think, especially within cities, the, the transformation is uh, uh, probably faster and more obvious than, uh, than outside of cities. I think all European cities have an uh, have some kind of green vision, green plan, um, or yeah, they call it different things, aimed at uh, uh, decreasing congestion, decreasing pollution, uh, taking away space from heavy traffic, giving it back to pedestrians, uh, to people on light vehicles, such as bikes, such as scooters, such as uh, uh, yeah, light, light electric mopeds and so on. Um, and, uh, um, I think by 2030, all European cities have said that uh, yeah, they should be combustion engine car free. Uh, so, 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 so those are, of, of course, kind of fundamentals uh, for, for a big change that we start to see now in cities like Paris, in cities like Stockholm and so on, car free streets, um, car free zones, congestion, uh, um, yeah, con congestion fees and so on. And I think all of that uh, uh, pictures a quite bright future for both uh, companies like Flix Flixbus, uh, but also companies uh, like Voy, who will take market share in that environment. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks. And so if, if you would want to show the results from, from the poll, that, that would be great. And meanwhile, I can just say that uh, obviously I, I agree with Fredrik that I think in transportation, we don't get appropriate recognition for enabling so many other industries, but we we're happy to act in, in the background. Um, then moving on, I, I thought before jumping into to the questions regarding strategy, it would be interesting to better understand the environments that Waze and, and Voy are uh, acting within. So I, I was planning to discuss kind of the challenges and competitive forces that uh, that you are facing. Um, and and Fredrik, maybe if you could start and, and talk us through, because I think what's really interesting with what Voy is doing is that in many ways you're, you're building a new category and, and there must be a lot of challenges in terms of safety, writing regulations, customer adaptations and, and whatnot. Um, could, could you talk us through what do you think are the most important challenges to solve? I think 
the the short version of that would be uh, safety and uh, finding the the regulatory framework um, uh, for micro mobility. Um, I mean, the regulatory piece is um, um, is uh, the same for a lot of nascent industries. I mean, it's the same. It was the same for Hendrix industry. I think uh, symbolized in uh, uh, in Airbnb um, ten. Yeah, five, ten years ago, and still is. And for us, um, yeah, we're very much working on that now. How should regulations for uh, for shared micro mobility look like in cities uh, all over the world? The second topic there is safety. As we are in transportation, there will always be a degree of risk. Um, yeah, when moving around, doesn't matter whether you're walking, whether you're on a bike, whether you're on a scooter, uh, in a car, um, in a plane. So those two things, safety. And make sure regulations end up where we want them to end up uh, are the kind of two key risks and two key challenges um, uh, we're seeing currently. Thanks. And if I, I can move a similar question to Henrik, where I would, I don't know if you agree, but I would argue that uh, on, on your side, you're more digitizing an existing industry, maybe rather than entirely creating a, a, a category. Um, would you agree with that? And what are the challenges that you see in, uh, in doing that? Yes, I would agree that we are digitizing an existing industry, but the digitization of is changing the industry. So when I started, and credit here to, uh, to Handels, because um, uh, I actually started my first job in travel was with Mr. Yet uh, in Sweden, which was a subsidiary of Spray, which was founded by mostly Handel's alumni. Um, and back in the day, I mean, you could sell an air ticket, uh, or we tried to sell air tickets, and I think we were the only website in Sweden that managed to take payment for it. Forget about hotels. Um, hotels was too complex at the time to solve. Nobody was doing hotels online. And if you think about what's happened over, over this period where, um, especially I would say the changes have been happening both on the air side, but more so on the accommodation side, because the, the reason hotel chains existed, for example, like Hilton was, if you went to London, you didn't know where to, where to stay. Well, a, a famous brand was something you could, you could relate to. Of course, with the, the advent of things like TripAdvisor, photographs online, reviews, um, you know, it became much more comfortable for people to not only stay in a chain hotel, but stay in a boutique hotel. And if you extend that, what's then happened with the likes of Airbnb and, and our, my business, people are now very comfortable in what I would call the accommodation continuum. So people consider different types of stays for different holidays they might have. So I may love a, a great Hilton for a business trip on a Tuesday. I, will, I may want to stay in one of our holiday homes in Croatia um, in, in June. And I may think of an Airbnb in Stockholm for a reunion weekend with SSE would be a, a perfect um, uh, a perfect trip. So all of these things were not really possible before the digitization happened. So yes, we are. It's an existing industry, but the digitization has really given consumers much more power, which I think is why you can now explore many more things and 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 look for things. And I think just one in, last interesting thing with travel. I'm biased, of course, but the number of research uh, events people do before a trip over the past 10 years has been going up. So if you look at almost any other e-commerce category like Amazon, it's one click, you, you spend fewer and fewer clicks. People actually spend more time researching a trip than less because they just want to start living the trip even before they go. Which I guess speaks a lot to, to the experiential part of, uh, of, of travel and, and I think the economy is shifting more and more to experiences for, for people. Um, brilliant. So, if, uh, if if we move to focus on the competitive environment that, that you're facing, because both of you are in a big and, and high growth uh, market, so, so I, I'd love to hear from your side how you define the markets where, where you're present, uh, who you consider to be your competitors, and Henrik, perhaps if you start, if, if you could also help us uh, to understand how you look at um, uh, being in a mark like a two-sided marketplace, and and how you balance uh, being the market maker, having uh, customers on one side, and then the property owners on the other side. 
Yep. So our vision is to delight owners and guests. So we're very clear on that. We need both sides of the marketplace to work for us to succeed. On the on the guest side, it's a it's a, a battle royale with everybody, frankly, um, ranging from Google to Booking.com to Expedia, and we have a lot of frenemies that we collaborate with, but also compete with. Uh, so the fight for eyeballs and and the fight to get co consumers or guests that we call them in a sustainable way is is a you know is a very hard battle to fight and you need some scale to do it. Um, on the owner side, it's a bit different because we don't necessarily compete with Airbnb because we want people who don't want to manage a property themselves. Of course, over time there could be technologies that make some of that, there's a bit, little bit of an overlap, but mostly we tend to people second homes and um, we work in non-urban destinations. Uh, so people need help with cleaning, et cetera. And we organize all of that for them. So it's a smaller set of uh, competitors on that side, but of course um, you have people like all your vacation rentals uh, across Europe and, you know, and, and indeed India. Uh, you have people like Sykes in the UK, you know, big, and there's a bunch of startups like uh, in, in the US, um, which have received a lot of funding uh, in this area as well. So it is a it is a um, uh, highly sought after category. And I think with with COVID, we've seen probably an, an acceleration of those interests into this category because people are sick and tired of sitting in, in their own four walls and and they, you know, they've also discovered, like I heard one of the, um, like uh, Annette was saying in the beginning that you could, um, or she told us before the call started that, you know, you, you can work from a different location. You don't have to sit in your own house and, and, and do the work. So yeah, a wide range of competitors. And um, it's a, I think a $1.6 trillion category. So a lot of money in travel, which means a lot of people are interested in trying to extract money from the, the value chain. Thank you, Henrik. And, and Friedrich, I've heard an interview with you previously where you said that there is limited diversification in, in your industry on the product side. And one of the main parts where you compete is kind of running heavy operations in, in very different type of markets. And um, I've also seen Lime, one of your competitors, and for full disclosure, I, I worked for them a while back, but, but have no relation with them anymore. Uh, a move to a marketplace model where they add other companies uh, offering into their own application. And so how do you look at the uh, competitive space and, and how do you position yourself to win? Yeah, I think, I mean, we're in the transportation business and, the, and currently the sub sector of that's, that, uh, that's you know, shared mobility within cities. Um, I think uh, when we are looking at competitors, this, uh, this industry and Voy and our closest uh, direct competitors are still very young, three, four years old, including Lime. Um, what we are seeing overall in our industry and I think in many other industries as well is that it seems like it, too early, too many companies are trying to figure out what the end game is and solve for the end game before they have mastered the core business. And our core business now is very clear, it's shared micromobility in big cities. I think to be good at that, uh, you need to be excellent at operations, uh, you need to have an excellent product and kind of reap the benefits of that this is an early industry with a very steep technology curve still. And as a layer uh, in our industry as well, uh, you have regulations, um, we're starting to have licenses, tenders, contracts with cities uh, all over. So as we see it, uh, it's still very early on. Uh, we believe that focus is key. Uh, so 2021 and 2022 will be very much about fighting the street fight and win those licenses, get more rights than competitors, uh, make micromobility accessible for more people um, yeah, than what we have uh, done so far. And kind of on the base of that, millions of users, uh, licenses, long contracts with cities, a brand with you know hundreds of thousands of uh, billboards out there. Um, we think we can attack other uh, business models and other needs uh, within uh, cities as well. But that's kind of, yeah, mid long-term horizon. So sorry to jump in, just curious, Friedrich, how do, how do you build 
continuous relationships with the city if the like the mayor or the municipality changes? How do you sort of make sure you get consistency across different political cycles? So I guess there are two uh, um, two cases here. One case with a city that uh, uh, doesn't have a license, doesn't have a contract with any operators, where it's kind of free competition, as it currently is in uh, in Stockholm, as an example, and in most Nordic markets. And then we have the other case, uh, such as in the UK, where all cities we're operating in, and it's getting close to 20 now, uh, we have licenses, contracts with the cities. And those, lic those licenses, contracts, are not uh, kind of mayor or party uh, specific, of course, but they run over a specific time period. In the non-licensed markets, it's uh, it's more you know classical relationship building, lobbying. Thank you, and that's that's a great segue to to my next question, actually. And, and the idea was, and now that we discussed the environment that you uh, operate within, to, to focus a bit more on the strategy, and I actually wanted to zoom in specifically on um, on, on kind of the system with uh, licenses and, and permits within cities. Um, and and you already started talking a bit about this, Craig. But my my understanding is that that is really what defines the supply situation in for your business in, in uh, the cities where you operate. So it'd be interesting if you could talk us through those two models that, that you just mentioned and kind of what is your opinion? What, what is the best solution for cities? Is it to have permits or not? And what's the strategy that you apply in order to, to achieve that? Good question. And I think if we if we yeah, turn back the tape a couple of years ago when we and other companies, including uh, Lime, um, launched in markets and went live with uh, both shared uh, e-scooters, shared e-bikes and yeah, perhaps some other vehicles as well, uh, the markets weren't regulated at all. So it was kind of a free battle, free competition in pretty much all cities. Uh, that ended up uh, in a very messy situation in many markets. I think Paris uh, probably being the best uh, example of that, where it was kind of the, uh, what do they call it, scooter get on or <laughs> scooter wars with uh, um, a lot of companies with a lot of capital, bad product, bad operations, and not really incentivized to uh, kind of solve parking safety um, and, uh, and clutter. Uh, cities quickly realized, and we also quickly realized that uh, if this continues, uh, we won't be long lived. Um, so we, I mean, we said from day one that we think that the best way and the only way uh, in this uh, business is uh, um, yeah, good regulations. Um, regulations that uh, encourage good behavior uh, to minimize um, the, the pain points around our business and the challenges yeah, around parking and around safety. Uh, initially sustainability less so now since we have come a long way on that uh, um, on that topic so we are uh, we are pro regulations uh, definitely in uh, uh, in our core business and uh, have also seen that that uh, uh, that has become kind of a, a competitive advantage uh, compared to um, some yeah some other companies mainly the americans which come from another uh, mindset uh, silicon valley move fast break things um, not very used to regulations Interesting. Thanks. And um, Henrik, I, I wanted to pick up again on, on the topic of the, the two-sided platform. And um, I wanted to see, you know, the, and the question has two parts. The first one is, do you think that you as, as a market maker have a certain responsibility for the kind of long-term success of, the, of your partners or the supply side, the, the, the property owners? Uh, and kind of as a follow-up to that, uh, what initiatives and uh, uh, relations do you have in place in order to support them to achieve a long-term sustainable business model? Uh, it's um, a good question. On the supply side, so getting properties and parks, it's a very local business. So the um, it's very you know. So if the demand side is algorithms bidding at scale, PPC bidding, you know, and just quite quite geeky and technical. The supply side, all of, it has many technical components, like we build an owner portal, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the Croatian people want to talk to Croatian. Um, 
in, in Catalonia and Spain, they, they don't necessarily want to speak to a Catalan, but they want to speak to a Catalan, but not somebody from Madrid. And, and in the UK, we don't say, send any English people out to Scotland, but we have Scots dealing with the Scottish homeowners. And, and so it, it's, it's very local. You know, a property is, um, is a big investment for people. So, so they want somebody they, they feel will take very well care of it. Uh, scale matters. Uh, we try to be as local as possible in terms of the teams we have on the supply side, and then we've centralized everything on the demand side. Definitely, uh, one of the main problems we have is, is churn. So on, on average, I would say the industry will lose about 15% of houses every year uh, because of death, divorce, people selling the house. Um, so, and it costs quite a lot to load a house, get the, get the property information out, out there. So we, we try very hard to kind of minimize churn. Uh, to stay very close to our owners, provide them with lots of information, accurate pricing, and especially in a year like, I know we're not talking about COVID, but being able to give them information of how to interpret government regulations, uh, being able to send out cleaning protocols, uh, you know, this is what we expect of you, and, and just making sure that, you know, when we did have vacations over summer, I mean, those things were all very important. So it's, it's a fun industry because you, you have to be very personable and kind of likable on one end, and then you have to be very hard and clinical and tech geeky on, on the other end. Hmm. Thanks. And I, I wanted to talk about kind of the, the plans for this year. And unfortunately, it's been possible not to, to somewhat consider kind of the, the pandemic and, and COVID. But uh, Henrik, what, how do you think in terms, is that something we are also kind of thinking a lot about at Flixbus at the moment? Like, how do you time the return to the market uh, in terms of uh, now big parts of, of Europe is uh, under lockdowns and uh, the different travel restrictions in place? And, and how do you time that uh, when do you return to the market, not to be too early, but not too late either? And then what are your plans for this year? Well, actually, for, and in my business is quite easy because we are, uh, we don't have to time anything that the servers are in the cloud. So when, when the, demand volumes go up, we, we get more servers. And, and um, the only thing we're doing is keeping, keeping the owner side, the, the, the property owners informed of what's happening. But demand, the one thing we got really wrong last year was how quickly demand came back. It, it came back with a vengeance. Uh, and even now in the UK, we're, we're strong double digits up versus where we were a year ago, which was really pre-COVID in terms of booking terms. Um, so we don't we don't have to we don't have any kind of fixed costs really. We furloughed some people, um, you know, who, who have to do with cleaning in areas which are currently forbidden to go to. But apart from that, we 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 can scale up very quickly, and we don't really have to change anything. Um, very different on, on my on my non-executive role at Finair. I mean, they, you really have to plan a month a month in advance to get the crews out because you have to be flight worthy. But none of those problems in in my in my day job. Thank you. And, and Fredrik, if, uh, if I can ask about your plans for this year, because when we spoke in preparation of this event, you mentioned that uh, micromobility had suffered less from, from COVID. Uh, and also, I think we also saw in the news that uh, Voy raised uh, a, a new investment round in December of $160 million. And, and first of all, huge congratulations to that. Of course, it's, it's a massive sign of trust from, from your investors. Um, but so what are your plans kind of with, with that for, for the next year? I mean, we are very, very positive for, for 2021. We learned a lot last year. And one of the biggest learnings when it comes to uh, our business model was exactly what you're mentioning, that uh, uh, of, all uh, of all mobility verticals, it seems like micromobility is, the, is one that suffers less uh, during a pandemic um, for a few reasons. One, um, as long as it's not a full, full lockdown, say the light lockdown environment we're living in, um, in Stockholm, as an example, people are still moving around within their city, not that much between cities and between countries, but still within their city. Um, another thing uh, that's, uh, um, that's of course positive for our utilization and demand is uh, that people don't want to get on a um, grand bus, grand metro, uh, but rather uh, move around in a, in a social distance uh, way. Uh, so we, um, yeah, we are optimistic that uh, 
um, yeah, as, as long as we don't go back to full full lockdowns uh, in a lot of markets where we're operating, uh, we think 2021 is going to be a really good year. And we feel the kind of macro tailwinds now uh, and the secular uh, tailwinds from uh, from cities really going to action um, when it comes to build more bike lanes, build more bike scooter parking spots, and uh, and pushing for this kind of a green recovery, uh, as cities like mm -hmm. London is uh, is calling it. Always trust London. Exactly. Um, Brent, uh, um, a, a last question on, on this uh, strategy section, and uh, it's uh, really a question for, for both of you. Um, what, one of the hotly debated topics over the last years have been network effects and, and the different shape and forms of it, and then whether it's local and global. Um, and I wanted to connect it with the fact that both of you have a European footprint. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on if and how you think network effects impact your industry and uh, if you're happy with your current geographical footprint. Yeah, I can start. I mean, our business is one with uh, no global network effects uh, compared to your, yeah, your uh, marketplace, social media, um, yeah, social media business uh, or similar. We have uh, some local network effects. I mean, it's very much a city by city uh, game. We don't, we don't gain, um, yeah, that much benefits uh, uh, from users in Stockholm um, um, for our business in Gothenburg or in Berlin or Hamburg. Uh, so our networks effect are, are, um, yeah, very uh, local. We rather have um, economies of scale. And also this uh, kind of positive virtuous cycle of uh, um, working well with cities that gives us more users, that gives us, you know, more proof points that this is something that should should stay in cities. Um, so it's more a positive, vir <laughs> a positive virtuous cycle and uh, economies of scale than the typical net network effects uh, we saw, for example, at Aviro, and I guess are quite similar to what uh, Henrik did as well. Yeah, very similar. We have some. On the supply side, side, some low local where we have, for example, west of Denmark in Yulan, we have a lot of houses that we maintain and clean. So, of course, you don't just want to clean one house. You want to have a couple of hundred in a village is better than, than one. But, but apart from that, you know, same thing as Federico was saying, definitely economies of scale. So that's where we see the, um, the benefits. And in terms of Europe, I think we are happy with where we are. I would like to... I would like us to be better at driving more local demand in Southern Europe. We are still very much a UK brand and Northern European brand. We have a lot of properties in Croatia, Spain, Italy, uh, but a lot of that demand comes from Germany. So that's something I'd like to change. Thank you. And then um, before we move on to, to the last topic uh, for, for this discussion, just a reminder that if you have questions for, for the Q&A, please share them in the chat to Anna Monson, who, who will then forward them. Um, so then kind of as, as a last topic, I, I know that this uh, event is about the future of travel, but I actually wanna take the opportunity to discuss the future of work with, with Henrik and, and Fredrik. Um, there, there's a lot of changes coming from uh, the, the COVID and the pandemic. Uh, I think one of the major and, and potentially most important changes is to how we will be working uh, in the future. Uh, and I think kind of having this opportunity with two strong leaders of, of sizable companies, it would be very interesting to th see what, what you think about it. Uh, and Henrik, would you care to, to start and kind of tell us what you think about location and, and flexibility? And uh, I know you, your, your view might have changed throughout the pandemic. So I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I mean, the COVID, of course, being a big medical uh, crisis and a horrible thing with millions of people dead across the world. But but from a purely business catalyst perspective, um, it, it has been a, a good thing for us. Um, we are now using Zoom at, at my work. We use Teams, but it works very much the same way. Uh, we've shut three offices down in the UK alone. Um, uh, we're going to shut down a fourth. Uh, we're still going to have offices, but we will use them differently and we will staff, we will, we will get office space for the average usage as opposed to the maximum usage. 
uh, we will focus on more social events in the offices and kind of really doing the things you cannot do over 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 the screen. Um, so we will definitely be back in offices, but it will be different for most teams. The contact center, I think, is different. We need to have them in the office, and they do much better there. Um, I just recently took over our Danish operations from the UK. I would not have been able to do that without the uh, the digital um, uh, screens with which we're talking. And in, in many ways, it works much, much better than being there in person. Uh, in some ways, it works much, much worse, like creativity-wise. So. In terms of how we're acting, we are going to shift the focus of the office from being maybe on the hard content to moving more into the brainstorming and the social aspects that I believe are very important for work. Um, there'll still be work done, don't get me wrong, it's, you know, sort of good, good old Lutheran upbringing here, but, um, but we really change it because you can be so effective with, with um, you know, over the screen. So, so I do think that um, we will change how we work and uh, in, in a pretty fundamental way. And I used to be one who believed very much in Monday through Friday, come in early, leave late, the, the whole, I'm getting old, um, so forgive me. But, um, but I, I just see how, how effective we are. We, we just hired, for example, a, a search and optimization specialist who lives in Spain. And, and we, you know, he doesn't need to move to the UK. So you know, all of these things are just really opening up opportunities for us that, that we would not otherwise have had. Thanks. And similarly, Fredrik, you've uh, at, at Voy had a really explosive growth and, and hired hundreds of people over the last three years. And, and I'm sure that there's more expansion to come. Um, how, how do you think in terms of locations and, and offices and, and in the future? Um, it's an interesting one, and I'm I'm kind of changing my <laughs> my view and take on it uh, uh, as we go. Fundamentally, I'm a strong believer in uh, in freedom, especially in technology companies for highly skilled employees um, who are really looking for, you know, autonomy. It's creative work um, where the relationship between kind of input and um, and output is not the same as it was in factories a uh, hundred years ago. So I think fundamentally, what highly skilled workers want is uh, uh, freedom. Um, I at some point, I was kind of a strong work from anywhere you want, remote forever um, person. I realized that uh, uh, I believe more in some kind of hybrid model, um, probably similar to what uh, Henrik is talking about, where you have access to offices for the people who want to feel more productive and so on, uh, being in an office and also a place, kind of social uh, social areas and places to get together. Uh, to brainstorm with your team, to run workshops and so on. But then, of course, a lot of the uh, kind of crunching and so on can be done um, anywhere. Um, I think what we will see, though, is that a lot of companies, uh, or we're, I think it's it's already a fact that companies will go more remote. So as the same way as I started this, uh, with that the, the car is being unbundled, I think there is an unbundling also of, kind of where you live and where you work, which will make... Uh, um, eventually, cities um, cities more to kind of a uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. The change is really that cities have been this, this, the center of production. I think in the future, cities will be more kind of destinations for consumption, um, which is uh, a, a big shift that's uh, uh, that's happening now. I think. Thank you. Yeah, that's it's going to be interesting to see how we will be working uh, in the future. Uh, so. With, with that, we, we reached kind of the end of the first part of the discussion. And uh, just want to say a big thank you to Henrik and Fredrik for, for this initial part. And we'll move to the Q&A section where Anna has been gathering the questions. Um, and uh, the first question that uh, is, is actually directed to Henrik, and I think it makes sense to follow up with this uh, last question we had, is regarding if you think that um, there's going to be an increased demand for uh, fiber connection and, and different kind of office uh, um, utilities at rental uh, properties where people can then, uh, rather than working at home, they, they can use the, the rental spaces to, um, to work from there as well. 
Uh, yes, good good Wi-Fi connectivity and fast Wi-Fi comes, I think, almost before you know the property being well cleaned in terms of demands these days. So very high. Whether it's going to be fiber or eventually 5G, that I I don't quite know. Um, but what we're seeing, even with people, a lot of people have mobile phones, is people really want to have a Wi-Fi, even though there are no roaming charges in Europe uh, anymore. I think that that's an expectation. So yes, one of the, the key uh, detractors, if we get a bad review, is that the Wi-Fi wasn't working or you know the router broke or you know the house didn't have it. So um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is a it is an almost an essential these days. Thank you. And a question that I think is relevant for, for both of you is um, uh, what trade-offs do you see between integrating tightly with local markets in order to work with authorities while at the same time needing to build global organizations? I can start on that one. I. I think uh, for us in our core business, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's key, and we can't live without the very very uh, deep integration with uh, uh, with local markets uh, that we are seeing. Uh, given what I talked about before, that we work so uh, it's, it's transportation, it's out on the streets, it's visible, and so on. Uh, we really need to work close with um, uh, with the stakeholders in the uh, in the markets we are operating. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, um, investment uh, to do so, uh, but it's also that, uh, I mean, to some extent, it's that um, yeah, that's creating the, uh, the modes and defensibility in our business to deeply, deeply integrate with, um, uh, with the local, with local ecosystem and hope that that will make us um, uh, stay in the market for, uh, for many years. But it's a huge, it's a huge difference. Uh, in how you have to build your organization and what kind of people you need in the company uh, compared to um, yeah, the marketplace uh, uh, business I saw at uh, Avido uh, in Russia. Yeah, like, like I mentioned before, on, on the supply side, on the property acquisition side, we, we tend to be very local. Also believe, like Felix said, that that's a mode for us. It takes investment. You have to build uh, up local teams, train them, and, and um, the owners tend to relate to a particular person that contacted them first. So that builds stickiness, which is great. So those are all good things. Now, do I, do I wish that every French municipality could maybe agree on which kind of tourist tax by how many people and how much for cats they charge, et cetera, and give us a bit more head warning? Yeah, that would be nice. Um, so, so in terms of the regulatory aspect, it's mostly good, but there's a lot of municipalities and, and regions in Europe who've discovered that this is a taxable industry and, and they've all come up with their own uh, little personal schema on how to collect it. And, and that has made it a little bit tricky to operate in the short term. I think, I think to, to add to what Hendrik said also, I mean, this is one of the, the, the most common arguments why, uh, why US companies are becoming much bigger than the European companies as well, uh, since it's easier to scale a business in one big country, one big market, uh, the US, of course, with uh, uh, with states and so on, but relatively homogenous uh, uh, legislation compared to Europe, uh, where you, as Hendrik said, uh, sometimes have kind of municipal uh, policies and legislations, and you need to adjust and tweak so much, uh, which makes uh, scaling uh, slower. For just a stupid example, but for us, for example, when you know when you check into a hotel, it's normal you present your passport because you're, there's a reception. Well, there's no reception to our holiday home, so when we get, when we have to know the age of the kids and verify that in a small rural French village, you know, without being in breach of GDPR issues, etc. I mean, you know, it creates um, challenges. I mean, it's it's always opportunities, of course, in the long term. But just like Felix said, I mean, it's just obvious in, in some of these markets that. You know, it's detrimental to, to overall commerce. And I'm, I've been picking on France right now, but it's, um, and I shouldn't do that because France is a wonderful country, but um, we, see that we see it more in Southern Europe that, you know, sort of lots of creativity from local, local governments, which I think in the long run is not good either for them or, or necessarily for us. Thanks. And Henry, we, we have another question for, for you as well that's 
luckily doesn't involve the French uh, at this point. Um, the, the question is, do you see a future in managed housing uh, or, or do you rather see a broadened managed vacation resources such as boats, cars, Well, I mean, the, uh, on the resorts, I, well, I do see, well, I do see a future managed housing, otherwise I, I shouldn't have this job. Uh, and, and again, the managed part is mostly for the owner. It's somebody who wants some help, who's willing to pay a bit higher commission, not to have to deal with the day-to-day -day, uh, the day -to -day stuff. The, the guests, I think some guests know the difference because we have inspected and we know that the houses are there. Um, now, we should, I should be paranoid because, of, of course, over time, there's going to be technologies developed that make it easier for the owner to and they're already out there to manage Airbnb, et cetera. So, but I do think that there is a clear space for, you know, and it's also very hard to do things like cleaning and manage that and, and to do it in a proper way where you offer a whole solution. Um, I think there's other categories like the parks business is actually half of my business. And as a Swede, because in Sweden, we, we tend to have a, so much to get uh, uh, or, or access to one if we don't have one. Um, so I was really unfamiliar with the whole holiday park sector, but that's a huge sector. Uh, and the Dutch love nothing more than driving away for a long weekend and, and staying in a holiday park, which is essentially a small little bungalow. Uh, they bring their mountain bikes, they, they do their cooking in, in, in the bungalow. And, um, and so they're, you know, these uh, semester beer or, 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 or holiday parks are a big, big business. Uh, even here in the UK, you have caravan parks. So for people of, who don't have a lot of income, you can have a fantastic holiday for 300 pounds for four people for a week. Uh, and we also do boats, actually. So there's a um, only in the UK where you can rent boats to go in the uh, Norfolk Moors, which abroads, um, which is uh, again an, an industry that I was completely unfamiliar with. You go on canals, and and apparently people like doing that. So uh, it's been a very um, educating journey for me as I as I got to know this sector, this sector of the uh, of the tourism industry uh, a couple of years ago. Thank you. And to, to round off the Q&A section, we have a last question for Friedrich. And uh, the, we, we received the same question in, in different formats. Um, but it's, it's mainly touching upon how important you think that various partnerships, and especially kind of in the first or last mile, is for your future growth. And, and if you consider it important, how do you enable this? Yeah, so, so far, very little of our growth has come through partnerships. It's like a single digit, uh, a single digit percentage of, uh, of all acquired users and all, all rides we're doing are coming from partnerships. I think the ones we're seeing working the best um, are usually um, either with um, well, um, kind of well developed uh, public transit operators um, yeah. and uh, in some cases, also mobility as a service app. So basically, apps companies focused on gathering a lot of mobility uh, alternatives in in one app. So those are the two that we have seen driving real, uh, real growth uh, so far. Then we have tried a lot of other uh, partnerships as well with payment companies like Klarna, um, and a lot of other uh, partnerships as well. We haven't seen them uh, being uh, um, yeah, being central so far in our growth. We think that we will continue to integrate with uh, uh, with public transit um, and other kind of high volume um, high volume transportation modes, um, but we don't really see um, a partnership being the yeah the biggest driver to growth uh, going forward. Okay, and with that, I want to say a, a really huge thank you to Friedrich and Henrik. Uh, it, it's been incredibly interesting to, to hear your thoughts on, on these topics. Really appreciate uh, the time that you have taken and, and the commitment to, to this alumni network. Uh, and really appreciate it. And, and with that, I hand over to Jessica, who is responsible for the alumni relations at uh, SSE. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see you. I'll just have a few closing words before everyone can hop off and, and continue with their day. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and joining us. Thank you to Frederick and Henrik for, um, for taking us into a little insight into your work. We've really enjoyed it. 
Um, so as you know, our alumni community has truly become global in every sense of the word um, because of COVID. And today was a great example of that. Otherwise it would have been hard to have so many of us in the same room because of we're all located in different countries. So um, we wanna encourage you to continue engaging, in engaging with SSE in lots of different ways. Um, you're welcome to provide feedback to us uh, through our surveys. And we hope you will save the date for homecoming, which this year will be digital. So hopefully many of you who are not located in Sweden can take a part of that. Um, save the date for March 31st, at 2 p.m. Central European time. And we will be delving into a lot of different topics, including looking at the research that we did with Sweden through the crisis. But it'll be a great opportunity to also hear from Fried Wenzel Postlar here, the, the student choir, which is really, really lovely. They have figured out how to crack the online choir experience, so you won't want to miss it. So thanks again for being a part of today. We look forward to seeing you again and hope you have a great rest of the day.